How's it going, guys? So this question that I wrote, exceedingly high yield for 2CK for internal medicine surgery and even family medicine. This could be a very lengthy discussion, but I will stay concise here. Before we get started, allow me to be my typical asshole, tell you to subscribe to my channel. I really appreciate it. Give the video a thumbs up. Really appreciate it. And find me on Instagram at melman underscore medical, M-E-H-L-M-A-N underscore medical. Link is down below. And find me on Telegram. Recently created a Telegram group and channel. Links are down below. Now let's start a fucking question here where we have a 64-year-old woman, five-minute painless loss of vision in her right eye. She reports no other symptoms. She has hypertension managed with lisinopril. Her blood pressure is 150 and 90. She has a three-on-six holosystolic murmur auscultated at the apex. Neurologic exam shows no abnormalities. Questions asking the most appropriate next best step in diagnosis. Now just diving right into it. What you need to know for 2CK is that if a patient has, well, this, by the way, is amaurosis fugax, which is a transient painless loss of vision in an eye. It's due to central retinal artery occlusion. So when a patient has uh, one of the following three things, retinal artery occlusion, TIA, transient ischemic attack, or a stroke, okay? A TIA is just a stroke under 24 hours. So one of those three things, you need to think immediately of either carotid stenosis, which is due to atherosclerosis, or atrial fibrillation, okay? Now, if you have carotid stenosis, you're going to have an atheroma, okay, with a plaque that'll launch off to the brain slash eye. If you have atrial fibrillation, you'd have a left atrial mural thrombus with that clot that can launch off to the brain slash eye. So when we consider those two possibilities, we look at the question, we say, do we have high blood pressure? If yes, think carotid stenosis. If no, especially in an older patient over the age of 70 or a high, or high yield risk factors such as hyperthyroidism, which can cause AFib, you want to think AFib, okay? Now, this patient has a blood pressure of 150 and 90. It's appropriately managed with lisinopril, but not sufficiently because the blood pressure is still high. I have seen 2CK questions where they say 140 on 90. That's still hypertension, okay? It doesn't have to be like 180 over 100. So patient has hypertension, we say that's most likely carotid stenosis. The biggest risk factor for the development of atherom atheromata in the carotids is hypertension, okay? You're going to have endothelial damage, the systolic impulse pounding on those carotids, that's your risk factor for carotid stenosis, okay? Plaque will launch off to the brain slash eye. So we think carotid stenosis, what are we going to do here? The answer is carotid duplex ultrasonography, straight up, okay? So here's your, I'm consolidating this a little bit more for you right now. Retinal artery occlusion or TIA or stroke plus high blood pressure, Answer equals do carotid duplex ultrasonography to look for a degree of occlusion. If greater than 80%, you're going to do endarterectomy. If under 80%, you can simply uh, manage with statin uh, plus uh, aspirin and diperidamol or clopidogrel. I don't want to get too heavy into that right now, but the point is you're going to do a carotid duplex ultrasonography uh, if you suspect uh, carotid stenosis, okay, hypertension. If, let's say this patient has great blood pressure, let's say they tell you, 74 year old who has a blood pressure of 115 over 70 and has amaurosis fugax, retinal artery occlusion, you say, well, not going to be carotid stenosis. That's likely atrial fibrillation. And we would do a normal ECG, okay? It would be electrocardiography. Now, sometimes to make the question really difficult is they'll tell you in the last line, they'll say blood pressure is 115 on 75 patient's older, and they'll say ECG is performed and shows no abnormalities. And the student says, oh, then it can't be AFib. That's not right, because AFib is often paroxysmal, meaning the patient will go home, have dinner, switch into atrial fibrillation for a half hour, then switch out. So in order to detect paroxysmal AFib, you would do a Holter monitor, which is also known as ambulatory ECG monitoring. Okay, so if the patient has good blood pressure and retinal artery occlusion, TIA, or a stroke, if they say in the last line ECG shows no abnormalities, the answer is ambulatory ECG monitoring, also known as Holter monitor. If the patient has high blood pressure, you're going to do carotid duplex ultrasonography. Okay, if you confirm atrial fibrillation with the ambulatory ECG monitoring, the next best step after that is to do your, echo, your echocardiography to visualize a left atrial mural thrombus, okay? Non-contrast CT of the head is the wrong fucking answer. This is what you would do for a stroke, okay? If you want to confirm your diagnosis of stroke, uh, looking for bleeding, okay? Ischemic versus uh, hemorrhagic. Once again, this can be a lengthy discussion, but this topic of atrial fibrillation versus carotid stenosis causing 
uh, retinal artery occlusion, TIA stroke, exceedingly high yield on 2CK for IM, surgery, and even family medicine. You know the deal. I'm going to continue to make more content. If you like my stuff, subscribe my channel, and I appreciate your time. That's it.